Ephesians chapter 5, Genesis 2 and Ephesians chapter 5. And if some of you would like to go to Rialto on Thursday or Saturday, um, it's a great time to help boost uh, the attendance. You can get to meet some new people uh, for Foundations Baptist and the Petersons. Um, if you'd like to go, um, if you want to go on your own, that's fine, but it'd be good if you had a little bit of a plan so maybe if you'd meet Brother Matuzak or talk to Brother Tim Peterson tonight, that would be a help in putting things in order there. Um, Genesis chapter 2 and Ephesians chapter 5, and I mentioned this uh, a week or two ago that um, I was going to take some time. Um, I just felt like it'd be good, especially for our teenagers, but for everybody. Again, this spring program, we're talking about lifting up things that the world is diminishing, and uh, the Christian home is one of those things, and um, manhood and womanhood and uh, being who God made us to be and and one of the things that this culture is just destroying is marriage and so it kind of started with that was one of my thoughts is I wanted to talk a little bit about marriage and lift up marriage you know Hebrew says marriage is honorable it's an honorable thing and um, so uh, and of course our culture is trying to destroy anything like that it's it's godly and, um, and so uh, I was going to teach, a, do a series out all started on the marriage vows and marriage and how it relates to Christ in the church because you'll find out an awful lot more about your marriage if you understand about Christ in the church. And you'll find more about Christ in the church if you study what God says about marriage. The two are, you'll see, they're intimately tied, more so than I thought. And then so as I, as I began to study and uh, work on some of these things, I thought, I thought this is going to be a real simple outline. This is, this is pretty major stuff. And um, so now I'm confused. <laughs> but uh, we'll try and work through this together. I'm not confused about who I should marry, though. I, I, you know, that's not confused. That's stupid. That's deceived. But um, here's a, just a, to start with a quick thought or two. And today's going to be foundational. And we're going to spend some time working on some things here that I think will be a help. Um, what is it that makes a marriage? I mean, here's a, you see here, two people got married last weekend. So what do you think of? What is it that made them married? And there's too many people here for me to let you throw out your thoughts because it'd be chaos. But uh, then I did this afternoon and someone said, unity. I said, oh, it's good. You ever meet a married couple that ain't unified? In fact, you ever met a couple that's really unified? <laughs> Somebody else said, uh, two Christians. Does that mean a Christian, there's, are there no Christians who are married to unsaved people? And somebody else said, um, two people that are committed in love or whatever. And have you ever met people who are married that don't love each other? Um, so what is it that makes a marriage? What is it that, what is the, the, that root thing that makes these two one? And um, there's, we have this culture, um, and I think ideally uh, a, mar a Christian marriage is a Christian man and a Christian lady who love God and love each other with the blessing of their parents and the love and support of their church, they make a commitment for life. Purity and faithfulness to one another for life. That's an ideal. But you know ideals are not always real. Um, we live in a broken world. And I remember in, in college one of the teachers saying, because probably half the students, half the guys in college were married when I was there. as a different world of Christian colleges than this than we are now. But and he said, uh, you guys, don't be thinking about who you'd marry if by chance God killed your wife. And I thought, these are the future preachers of America? I mean, is that really? And I thought, oh, I don't know. I've only had, I think I've only had once in all these years of pastoring, a lady asked me if it would be wrong to pray that God killed her husband. But it wasn't a man, it was a lady. Because, you know, men will punch you out and then they'll be your friend. But women, they're, you know, 
they're into this thing for life. <laughs> and and uh, I said, I don't know if it'd be wrong to pray, but I know it'd be wrong to, uh, to help. Don't lend a hand in answering that prayer. <laughs> that would be for sure wrong. But um, I think by the time, and this will be short tonight, but I think by the time we're done, um, I think I'll be able to say we've got to start on what marriage is. So look there with me at Genesis chapter 2, and we'll start there. Genesis chapter 2, verse 23. And this is familiar to most of you. Let's read in verse 18 first. And the Lord God said, it's not good that a man should be alone. Because a man by himself is just going to make a mess of things. He'll spend way too much money. And he'll be too idle and watch too much sports. But anyway, I'll make him a helpmate to boss him around. No, no, that's not what it says, is it? I'll make him an helpmate for him. And then um, down in verse 22, um, and the rib which the Lord had taken from the man made he a woman and brought her unto man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Now I think about that. If you read the verses before, when God said, I'll make him a helpmate, you know what he started doing? He started making the animals, you know, giraffes, gazelles, walrus. And it says, and there was not found a helpmate. I think, no. And then God made the woman. And so Adam wakes up and there's Eve. Now, I don't know what you would say, but I wouldn't say, verse 23, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. I'd be saying, thank the Lord. <laughs> I mean, but anyway, Adam had never seen a woman before, never been a woman before, but I'm sure that God made her perfect. But he says in verse 23, I want you to pay attention to the phrase, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Verse 24, skipping a few, a couple phrases, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Look over to Ephesians 5. You might keep your finger there. We may flip back and forth a little bit, but if you would then look at Ephesians in uh, chapter 5. And we're going to spend uh, most of the time here in Ephesians 5, but a little bit elsewhere. But uh, Acts, Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. So Ephesians chapter 5. And most of the last half of this chapter is on marriage. And it has to do with much more than marriage. So starting at um, verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the God. And from there to the end of the chapter, he's talking about marriage. But I want you to look down first at... Um, at verse 30, all right, verse 30, Ephesians 5, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Now, did you read anything like that in Genesis? Remember, Adam woke up, there's Eve, he says, this is now flesh of my flesh, bone of my bones, this is, and, and, and um, then shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and we read the same thing here in verse 30, we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Now, the Lord has marital um, vocabulary, I guess, for the simplest term, that ties to Christ, ties to God the Father and Israel. You read the book of Hosea, and we're going to spend some time on Hosea in a couple weeks. Um, there is definitely a marriage relationship between Israel and God. And then in the New Testament, there is a marriage relationship vocabulary and marriage relationship talked about Jesus and the church but thirdly there is also that marriage conversation between Christ and the individual and so we've got the individual Christian and then we've got the church and then we've got Israel and they're all three different and sometimes they can get confused a little bit but he says there uh, go back over to Ephesians chapter 1 and uh, there's just some, an obvious statement here, but just so you look at it. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. When you are in Christ, you are your bone of his bones and flesh of his flesh. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Just like a man and a woman, and um, my wife is back there, uh, halfway back in the auditorium, and we're not together, but therefore uh, shall a man leave his father and mother, and the two shall be 
one flesh. And so this is more, uh, this is a lot more than just being close. And you see between Christ and the church, or Christ and you as an individual, in verse 3, he says that we are blessed in heavenly places in Christ. You are, in fact, look over to chapter 2 in verse 6. Chapter 2 and verse 6, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together, made us sit, present tense, in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. When you get in Christ, when you are one with Christ, you are bone of his bones, flesh of his flesh. And if you look down there in chapter 5, about verse 32, somewhere in there, he says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So how could I be one flesh with my wife when last week I'm in Oklahoma and she's in California? Well, it's not what we see physically, but he said the two shall be one. And, and the first marriage uh, conversation back there in Genesis chapter 2, uh, he said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. Uh, she shall be called a woman. And then he uses the word wife for the first time. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife. And so there's the beginning of the husband-wife relationship. And they are one. There is a physical, supernatural bonding between the man and his wife. And it's not just what we see, because obviously we're, you know, some of you, uh, Wayne Records here, his wife's up in the other building with the children's class. And um, so we're not always together physically one's at work and one's at home one's at the grocery store and one's out uh doing whatever and so um just first of all let's just establish this thing go back over to chapter five and and understand again this is just very simple foundation but if you look at verse 30 for we are members of his body of his flesh and of his bones and Verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. You are a member of the literal body. And, and if we just use the word body, we could say, well, it's the body of believers. It's the body of water as Lake Elsinore. Well, whatever it is, I'm not sure it's water, but, but uh, the body of, you know, you talk about a group of people being a body, a body of believers, but it doesn't just say body. It says there that in verse 30, members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. There's a lot more. It's not just that he's the head of the church and we're supposed to do it his way. There is something between Jesus and the church supernatural. It's mysterious. And um, the more I've studied this, the more I realize, yeah, this is a mystery. I'm not sure I understand all this I'm reading myself, but we'll, we'll figure it out little by little. My wife and I have got a spiritual mystery relationship. I would say that I'm very close to our children, but if, a, if Josiah and Ruth Ann moved to Trinidad, they moved to Trinidad, and it's not what I, I mean, whatever God wants, it's his business, not my business. They're going to be away, and I'll see them whenever I see them, whenever the cruise ship takes us there. Um, but... Um, if my wife died, that would be totally different. And some of you have been there. And when, when a spouse, see this, this one flesh thing, it's a supernatural thing. And that's why people will say, I remember I was very young, just early, probably the first year or two of our ministry, and I was visiting a lady whose husband had passed away, and she was, he was a World War II vet. She was elderly, and, and I said, but it takes a long time to get over the loss of your husband. She almost snapped at me. You don't get over it. And um, well, what happens, that's one flesh that has been torn apart. You know, if you, I've got friends that I love dearly who were you know, members of our church and have moved across the country and I try to remember them, keep them on prayer lists. Our young people have gone through our church and school and gone to college and gone off. Almost all of them are on my, on my prayer list. But that doesn't cause an ache in my soul. They just live somewhere else. But when there's a death, it's this tearing. You see, here's one and here's another. You take two ones and they get married. They're one. And when one of them 
is gone, it, it's not two again, it's two halves. It's a loss that's indescribable. It's the same with a divorce. Why can two people, not to pick anybody, but two people who, who just cannot live together in peace, why can't they just peacefully leave? But it don't happen. Because they're one. And as much as they might want to do it as a Christian couple should do it or whatever, they're, te- they're literally tearing something apart. And this one flesh that God made is a sacred thing. And um, I, I know couples who, um, you know, married and um, for especially going back to my childhood, most couples then married with the intent of staying married. This culture that we're in of prenuptial agreements and, you know, somebody surveyed a bunch of college students here in Southern California. If you get married, would you expect your spouse to keep their marriage vows? And it's like 70% of our college students, secular college, about 70%, if I remember right, said they would expect their spouse to be unfaithful. And I thought, if I expected my wife to be unfaithful, I'm not marrying her. If I even thought there was a 10% chance of her being unfaithful, I assume fidelity. That's my assumption. And I think most people in my childhood grew up intending on being married. And then there's that tragedy that happens in, 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 in many cases, it happened, and a broken marriage takes place. And it's this tearing, and it was very difficult. And then I've watched them remarry. And, you know, once you get over that torn, and then there's this one and another one flesh here, and they can go on and live a Christian life, and they can have, have good homes, but you can't get away from this hurt. This, that's why, why sometimes people think, why, why, does this, why is this so horrible? Well, tear your arm off. You know, I, I remember my shoulder just getting pulled out of the socket a few times, and it really is consuming of every ounce of your emotions. You know, it's like, Oh, it's just my arm. Everybody else in my body is feeling good. No, the rest of my body does not matter. Right now I want to scream. And, and that's how it is. And, and so when there's a broken marriage, it's a tragedy. But obviously in the Bible he talks about it, and we're going we're gonna to look at that some. But the, the fact that, that two people got married with sincerity and earnestness and... And this, the world went wrong, and they went through that tragic splitting, and then now, down the road, maybe some will marry, maybe not, whatever, but they, they go down that road. Um, that's a different thing than the culture we're in today, where people just want to, you know, have their immoral relationships. Hey, well, in Genesis 3, Genesis 2, where we started there, um, what, do you think Adam and Eve were married? I'm asking literally here. Was it husband and wife? Did God call her his wife? Sure. Was there a pastor? Was there a ceremony? Was there a wedding ring? Was there a wedding gown? (laughs) Was there a $10,000 photographer? Was there a wedding album? So all these things, there was no reception, there was no wedding cake. How can you get married without a wedding cake? I mean, honest. What we elevate and and talk about as being a marriage or a wedding, it's probably not very scriptural. Remember Abraham said, I don't want my boy Isaac marrying one of these heathen girls in the country I live in. Well, and he says, I'll tell you what, I'm going to send my servant up to my wife's brother's house, up to Laban's house, and we're going to get, we're going to get a cousin. We don't do that anymore, okay? <laughs> and the Bible does talk about the change. When the law came about in um, Moses' day, they changed the rules on that, okay? Uh, there was a genetic modification. 
So the servant goes up, gets Rebecca, and, and brings her back. And Isaac's out meditating. He was not on Facebook. He was thinking about God and the things of God. And, and he's probably waiting for that girl. When is that servant going to get back? Would you trust somebody else to pick out your wife? Uh, no way, no way. Now, those cultures where the parents pick out the bride, <laughs> ain't going to happen. But anyway, so he comes back and the first smoker in the Bible, because Rebecca lit off her camel. And um, that's a great old joke, but anyway. She uh, gets off her camel. He takes her to his mother's tent. Daddy, I don't, from the scripture, dad didn't even meet the girl. There was no pastor. There was no walk down the aisle. There was no, there was no bridal party. There was no presence. They got married. Now, I tried the day to think, how many weddings can you think of in the Bible? You know, like a, a wedding party ceremony. I, th I thought of the uh, John 2, Jesus in Cana of Galilee. There was a wedding, right? And then maybe when, when uh, Jacob got Leah instead of Rachel, that was a bad wedding. <laughs> I couldn't think. Now, there's a wedding, the marriage supper of the lambs, a marriage. I couldn't think of another time in the whole word of God that it describes anything what we talk about as a, as a marriage. So what makes them married? you got to come back. Look, at, look back at Ephesians 5 and, and verse 28. I'm sorry, verse 27. We're going to be back in this many times in the weeks to come but in verse 27 that he might present it to himself a glorious church this is jesus in the church that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish that's what jesus is looking for in a church a holy church without blemish verse 28 so ought men to love their wives as their own body he that loveth his wife loveth himself. Now there's a tie. There's a tie there between Jesus loving. You're going to break it. Doesn't matter. Doesn't work anyway. There's a tie between Jesus' love for the church and wanting it holy without wrinkle and without spot, there's that tie that he compares to the tie of a, the love of a man for his wife. And see over here, we're his body, we're, we're bone of his bones and flesh of his flesh. And so when Jesus loves the church, he's loving himself, right? And so when a man loves his wife, and cherishes her, and nourishes her, and, and, uh, and cares intimately about her, he's loving himself. Because we, Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And so the two things, these, this is something supernatural and sacred. Look at that verse again. Look again at verse 29. For, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth, and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. Do you know Jesus cherishes the church? This last week, um, several of us were in Oklahoma, and uh, there was a couple there at the conference who live in this area, and they're going to another church, and uh, they told us oh, our church doesn't have soul winning, doesn't have buses. And um, this and that's different. And I wanted so bad to say, I know a church you could go to. But that church, Jesus cherishes that church. I don't want to do any tearing of what Jesus cherishes. You come 
trying to hurt my wife and I, you are in trouble. You try to sow discord into my marriage, that's a real problem. Because this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And every lady would like to be nourished and cherished, protected. Every lady would like a, a you know, the, you know, the knight in shining armor. Go kill the dragon. You love me so much. Look, I'll just go find another girl that doesn't need me to risk my life for her. <laughs> uh, I know how women think. <laughs> That's a joke. But anyway. So if I don't want anybody splitting this body, this intimate, cherished thing, why would I step into a, a, a church situation and, and cause hurt or division from a gospel-preaching church? He, Jesus loves that place. He wants to nourish and cherish that place. Now, if God leads somebody to move wherever, because, you know, some of you, you came here, you were already saved, and, and you already knew what you believed, and we just fit in with what you'd, been, you, you'd believed, and, and you joined, and we love that. But I'm not out trying to cause a division. Here, here um, you're at work, and some flirtatious person starts being forward, to cause a potential rift between you and that and one flesh, they're like ripping the flesh apart. That's evil. And let me just say, if you're single and you start being forward with somebody who's married, you are evil. You're beyond evil. Because that's bone of bone and flesh of flesh. And, and that man and woman, you, you've got no right to get involved with them. You know, well, we just love each other. Stop it. Confess it like murder. Confess it like drunkenness. You have no business caring and investing your feelings in one flesh. You, you just will take an axe and chop their arm off. Oh, that would be horrible. Not according to this. Do you know what? As far, and again, I'm not, I don't know everything, but as far as my understanding of the scriptures, God killed more people over adultery than any other sin in the Bible. Now, I don't know how many people died in Sodom and Gomorrah <clears throat> over their sodomite behavior. You got to take that out of the formula. But of the numbers that you can read in your Bible, adultery, God killed more people over that than any other sin. <clears throat> Why did he kill them? It really matters to God. It matters to him. And this, this remember when Balaam got the Israelite men chasing after the Midianite women? And, and um, the big Balaam couldn't curse them, but he could get them to get cursed all on their own. Well, why? why? Why is that so tragic? Why, why is it so tragic when, when a, a, a guy you know, runs off with another woman or a, man, a lady runs off with another man? Because you're shredding something that is cherished and precious. Jesus said that one flesh is so precious, I don't want you thinking about it. That's how precious that relationship is. And only the devil would want to damage the church that Christ loves so intimately. And only the devil would want to bring hurt to a husband and wife. And again, once a once. You, it's all through the scriptures, you know, and John, uh, the woman and the woman at the well, she'd had five husbands living with a guy she wasn't married to. God, uh, you know, John chapter 8, the woman taken in adultery in the very act. Remember, Moses in the law commanded such should be stoned. That's how serious God takes it. 
But Jesus said, no, man can, no man's condemned you. Go and sin no more. There is a, all right, you went through this tragic, tragic shredding of something sacred. Now be careful. Be on guard and walk carefully. If you go back over to verse um, 31 of, of Ephesians 5, this is a mystery, he says. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother. For what cause? For the cause, because back in verse 29, he nourishes and cherishes, and the man um, should nourish and cherish the woman. In verse 30, we're members of his body, of his flesh, of his bone. He goes right from the married man in verse 29 to Christ in the church in verse 30, then back to the man in verse 31. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and be joined unto his wife, and two shall be one flesh. This is, this is also in, in Matthew chapter 19. You want to look at it sometime. You can find the same passage there. He quotes, each time he's quoting the very first time marriage is mentioned in, in, in Genesis. And he says in verse 32, it's a mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Verse 33, nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. Let me just quickly close with this. Can I, is there any chance this thing will work? How about every time a service starts, you turn this mic on? That'll be good. Then I won't throw it. Down this aisle, a daddy walks with a girl, and he stops right there. And biblically, the father is the authority. And the preacher says something like, who gives away the bride? Because you have no right, young men, you have no right to that girl. She is not yours. You keep your hands off, young ladies, or old ladies. You old men. Her dad may not be living. It's, 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 there's so much symbolism. He walks down the aisle and the preacher says, who gives away the bride? And by the way, I won't do a wedding unless the dad and mom are for it on both sides. Not a chance. I'm not going to be a party to that. Go find somebody over in Las Vegas. Let them do it. You can go to the courthouse and get legal somewhere. And so the preacher says, who gives away the bride? The dad says something like her mother and I do or I do or whatever. And then the guy walks down. And the father, the one that's the authority, he is willingly accepting this change the girl walks down the aisle she is willingly offering herself into this relationship and the guy comes down usually shakes hands with the dad or or uh, you know ducks when the dad tries to punch him and takes the girl's arm and brings the girl up here and and the girl and the guy they are both up here of their own free will now that's important because nobody's going to make the girl marry the guy. And no one's going to make the guy marry the girl, right? That would be called Calvinism. That theologically, God ordained you to get saved and go to heaven and ordained you to go to hell. It doesn't work. This thing about Christ and the church and the husband and the wife, it's all free. Jesus says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. He didn't make you come. He said he invites you to come. And salvation is a whosoever will let him come. And so the, the, the invitation at Calvary, whosoever shall call in the name of the Lord shall be saved. You don't have to. You want to go to hell? Go ahead. You can die and, and waste your life if you want to. And so the groom's here, the bride, and the, the groom's on this side, maybe the bride's over there, and I say to the groom first, would you have this woman, and on and on, and, and he, it's his choice. He could say, you know, really thought about it, I don't think so. Now, that's a, a, an awkward moment. <laughs> we had a young bride, not a young bride, but a, a younger bride stand at the tent door many, many years ago and said to the maid of honor, I shouldn't be doing this. And thank God for the maid of honor who said, let's go. I will go with you. The preacher will figure this out. Let's just get in the car and go. And the bride wouldn't let her, and they went on with the wedding. I, w I wish the maid of honor would have come up to me and said, she don't want to do this. But um, 
that we're, you know, she, the, the groom, it's his choice. And then the bride, she's got to willingly choose. This is, this is so symbolic of salvation and of the love of God and God's desire. And so I say to the wife, would you have this man to be your lawfully wedded husband? Would you love him, honor, cherish, and keep him, and on and on? And uh, do you so promise? I do. And, and see, all of that, the dad says, I'm in this. And the groom says, I'll accept this. And she says, I'll accept this. It's, it's by choice. It's freedom. But the commitment there, the commitment there begins, and we'll talk about it next week and the week after, but in verse 32, I'm sorry, verse, uh, verse 30, for we're members of his body, of his flesh, of his bones. So, verse 29, you, should, you can't say ugly words to your spouse. No man ever yet hated his own flesh. You know, your, your co-worker can cuss you and you come home and it's okay, but let your spouse cuss you. When we were engaged, Ms. Mrs. Goddard and I, Dr. Evans, the college president, had a list of ten, his ten commandments for marriage, and one of them uh, stuck in my head more than the others. It was never use the club of disapproval. And, and you know, and I, and, and I know I've not done that right, but I think I don't want to beat my wife up with me not approving of her. Because Jesus sure accepted me. Just like I am. Like the invitation without one plea. He just said, come on, I'll take you. And the next couple of weeks we'll, we'll, we'll get more of this, but, but the big deal, young people, about morality and biblical purity, it is sacred beyond words. And we're not talking about no forgiveness. We're not talking about, you know, you're going to die and go to hell. But there is a grief of heart and soul that is a picture of his grief when the people of God get at odds with one another. And when somebody tries to tear up a church and tries to hurt the work of God, I never want to hurt another human being, for one. Certainly don't want to hurt a Christian, and I never want to hurt a church. Because it's Jesus cherishes that thing. And your marriage is far more important than you realize and young people and adults as well, your more marital and your, even as a single person, your purity is way, way more sacred than you understand. All right, let's pray. Father, help us as we enter in these few weeks talking about this very sacred thing. And I pray you'd help our young grow up with deep reverence and respect for marriage and for purity and for commitment. And may we understand a little more as we look at it, this precious relationship you have with your church. We thank you, Lord, for loving us, putting up with us. We're all, there's a bunch of broken plays in this world. You've, you've dealt with the beaten up and the hurting and the wounded. But I pray you'd help us to please you and to be faithful to this organization that you nourish and cherish. Bless us and lead us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, God bless you. Have a great